Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. We are going to begin today's meeting uh, by taking up item number one. Item number one is to present a proclamation recognizing October 2013 as Italian Heritage Month in Tulare County. Supervisor Ishida, he's actually is Italian. Don't let his appearance fool you. <laughs> Nick here. Come forward, please. Join me over here. On behalf of the board, I'd like to present you this proclamation recognizing October 2013 as Italian Heritage Month in Tulare County. You know, it's hard to believe five centuries ago, Christopher Columbus came to North America. And unfortunately, I'm getting close to the 100 years that... Uh, <laughs> I learned, you know, when you learn about it in grammar school, which I'm not even sure they teach you anymore. <laughs> but uh, it's been a long history of Italian-Americans that have helped shape our society and steer the course of our history. Whereas the sons of Italy, uh, Enrico Caruso Lodge was instituted in June 2000 and, excuse me, 1927. It's founded on the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity. When a lot of people came to this country from different parts, they always grouped together, and usually, surprisingly, they came from the same region. And it was a, it was a social outlet, and also gave them strength to deal with the issues with the new country. So now, be resolved, Clary County Board of Supervisors hereby recognizes October 2013 as Italian Heritage Month in Tulare County and encourages Tulare County residents to learn more about the history of Italian Americans. And with that, I'd like to make this, present you with this proclamation. Thank you very much. And a photograph. Okay. And Nick, would you like to say a couple words? Yeah. Uh, like uh, Ishida, Mr. Ishida said, you know, from Christopher Columbus until today, we've had a tremendous influence of uh, influx of Italians in this country. Uh, they've contributed a lot to the uh, to the United States of America. In fact, in the audience, there's two immigrants from Italy, uh, Frank Parisi and and uh, I can't think of his name now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, Luisi. <laughs> uh, and then there's a lot of uh, first generation, like myself. My parents came from Italy, in fact, from the same town, Putignano, which is a sister city of Visaya, because there's over 100 immigrants from Putignano, which is a town of 25,000, into Tulare County. And one of the oldest living couples of immigrants. Uh, First generation is Ida and Lawrence Romanazzi, which are over 90 years old, and what, 63 years of marriage? 69, 69 years <laughs> of marriage. <laughs> and so it's an honor for me to receive this proclamation in, uh, for the Sons of Italy. All right, thank you very much. And actually, you know, I, I don't know why I didn't present that proclamation. I actually have a little bit of Italian in me. My, my godmother's actually in Italy right now, but uh, you had the, the full-blooded Italian make the presentation, so again, my apologies. All right, next we're going to move on to item number two uh, on the presentation. Uh, or, I'm sorry, on the agenda today. It's a presentation given by United Way uh, regarding the 211 referral line program. Jeremy, it's all you.
Thank you for uh, having me here today to talk to you about the 211 information and referral line here in uh, Tulare County. For those of you that don't know what 211 is, it's an information and referral line that connects people to resources throughout our county. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our highlights from last year and give you some data that we collected from our clients that we serve. So last year we distributed over 115,000 pieces of material to every school in Tulare County and we did that by um, bookmarks. So hopefully we encourage kids to read but also inform them about the services that 211 offers. And we also hired, with the help of HHSA, Mental Health, Tulare Works, and uh, First Five of Tulare County, we were able to hire full -time, a full-time resource specialist and an outreach specialist. And what this has allowed us to do is to actually be a little more thorough on updating our resources and um, getting public awareness of what 211 can offer, not only to the public, but also to providers. And by providers, I mean the um, people we have in our database on the services that we can offer, not only to them, but to their clients. Um, when I first started here at, with United Way as their 211 director, I noticed that the website that we offered was not as user friendly as I would like to have seen it. So I updated it and I developed a new graphical interface that allowed easier access for our clients to utilize 211. And it's just a picture, we're always updating um, and figuring out ways to make it easier for people to access resources, because that's the whole goal behind 211, is to connect people to resources without any hassle. No wrong door taken, just you know, give them the number, they can call and they can get connected. And then also, if you wanna check out our website, we have 211tulerycounty.org, that's the website that I'm working on. And then through our state network, 211 California, we developed a 211 iPhone app, so all of you can download it on your smartphones and uh, check out the, the new app. We also have included um, our Covered California in, in the database, as you all know, I'm sure, that today is the opening enrollment for the new Affordable Care Act, and we have included that in our database to help connect people to that um, insurance. And then we've also increased our outreach activities. Through our outreach specialists, we've been able to go out to over 50 outreach events last year, as well as presentations, and we've gone to health fairs, step-up events, farmers markets, and swap meets have actually been really, really successful with reaching uh, different demographics. We've also served, so last year we served over 10,000 individuals. And then the satisfaction data is something that I really enjoy, and that's when a client calls, we ask them a series of questions, including demographics, but also how satisfied they are with the services that they're receiving. So last year, 99% of callers requested, or uh, who called, said that they would recommend 211. 83% said that they, the information was provided was accurate, and we'd like to increase that, hopefully, with this resource specialists, we're gonna be able to increase that number to the 90s. And then 97% um, receive the referrals that fit their needs. Sometimes our resource specialists, when they call, have to do a little bit of case management. They have to find out what their needs are and then try and read between the lines sometimes. This was our call volume for last year. You can see a surprising trend is that August and September is, is actually our highest call volume. And I believe that's, and you'll notice on the next slides, that's because of the um, air conditioning, electric use. That's one of our biggest resources. Um, this is the top 10 caller needs. Our electric service payments and uh, rent payment assistance is our two biggest needs um, that we receive as far as calls. And um, it's kind of difficult sometimes because we have to find the resource and then see if there's enough grant funding to be able to support these, the number of calls we're receiving. And that leads into this. Um, which is the number of resources in our database for the number of resources that we receive. So you can see we have an abundance of food pantries, but we have very little in terms of electric service payment assistance and rent payment assistance, which is our biggest uh, number that we receive. And that, those numbers are actually the ones that are active throughout different parts of the year. So during December, this coming winter, um, there might not be grant funding to support the rent payment assistance or electric funds. We have to just keep calling and searching for new resources. This is a never ending battle to find resources. And then this is our errors problem needs comparison. And what all of you have, all the supervisors have in front of you is um, a breakdown by district, which is um, what 
what I kind of show here in terms of our AIRS needs, which AIRS is Alliance of Information and Referral Services, which is a way for us to categorize our taxonomies and to align all of our resources throughout California, throughout the United States, is all of them should be the same. So if you go to Los Angeles, the taxonomy is gonna be identical to the one we utilize here in Tulare County. And as you can see again, housing and utilities is the biggest need, second only to food and meals. Uh, I wanna say thank you to the Health and Human Services Agency, Mental Health Services, Tulare Works, um, Tulare County Board of Supervisors, thank you again for having me here. First five of Tulare County, our 211 network, and uh, our service providers that allowed us to put their information into our database. If the supervisors have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions from my colleagues or comments? Just Supervisor Worley. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I, I was looking at the age demographics of callers, and I, I know this is looking at District 4, and it shows um, like adults, it says 26 to 59, but then it has a separate category, um, 18 to 29. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious so, about how that was. So when I, when I came in, we, we went from a, a different database, and we went from Refer, which is another kind of software, to iCarol, and we had different ways to lay out the data. When we, when we merged with, or started, we got a grant from HHSA Mental Health. They go by, I think, <coughs> A, which is teens, adults, and youth. So that's the, the breakdown. I kind of had to make the transition to this new breakdown system. Oh, okay. So that's why it has the overlap. Oh, okay. This next okay. year, we've straightened it out. It'll be it's a lot easier to read. I guess just a comment, looking at this, what's, what's surprising to me is the small percentage of seniors. Yeah. It was primarily uh, people who were 59 years and younger. I don't consider 59 as seniors. Um, but I mean, as a senior, it was only a very small percentage. Yeah, we're, we're always trying to identify gaps in our services. And one of those is definitely um, older adults, as well as veteran services. And that's something we definitely lack in terms of services that we have in our database. And we're always looking for new providers to get in there. And I encourage all of you, if there's a gap in service that you identify and you see a need for, let us know and we will try to identify that and include it because we want to get as many resources in here as possible. Any other questions or comments? Um, I'll, I'll just make a comment. You know, I'm really glad that you brought this presentation. I know we met earlier this year to talk about this and I uh, sure appreciate the outreach you've made to me to show me um, what's going on in District 2 and in Tulare County. Um, I think this presentation is very informational, and, and you're right. It really is about getting resources out there to the community. Um, and when people do have questions and they don't have a, a pen or paper to write down on the long list of all the different providers and, you know, health and human services entities, um, hey, it's real simple. Just call 211, um, and you will get connected. And I think that that's, a, that's a very simple thing that people can grab onto and utilize, and they definitely are doing so. Um, I'm sure that call volumes will continue to increase, uh, and I appreciate all your efforts and appreciate the new director's efforts. Rosemary, you're doing a great job, and uh, uh, please do uh, utilize this board and uh, um, all of Tulare County if we can help uh, get this out in the community even more. Supervisor Rashida? I was surprised uh, housing and utilities by far in each district was the number <coughs> one uh, generator of calls. Very surprising. Thank you. Again. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks. All right. The next item we're going to move on to this morning is item number three. That is the public comment period. This time, uh, members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on today's agenda. Uh, public comments can and will be limited to three minutes. Is there anyone here wishing to speak under the public comment period? Um, sure. Go. And you can use either microphone. That would be fine. Please state your name and address for the record. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come before you. I'm out of Porterville, and my name is John Duran. Um, the reason I'm here is because um, on June of uh, 2012, I filed a complaint with a county grand jury for an investigation request <coughs> reference to the city of Porterville and some uh, questionable practices that were uh, very much concerned to me. <coughs> they went ahead and conducted a one-year investigation, and... Um, it led me to believe that uh, uh, that they uh, made recommendations to uh, the uh, district attorney of the county. I have not heard from the district attorney, even though I've sent two requests for uh, documentation under the Public Records Act. And I've uh, also written to you people, and uh, I have not received any information or comments or, or uh, a return for my concerns. 
So I'm here publicly letting you know that it's very uh, important that the board look into the matter. If you need the information, and only because I'm not allowed to speak on it in depth, but to contact the grand jury or the district attorney and find out exactly what the status is in reference to the allegations that were made. And I think it's very important because of the public uh, 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 taxpayers, because of taxpayers and because of uh, the voters that elect you to, uh, to serve as servants for the public. Uh, especially Mr. Ennis, you know, being from the Portville area, you got jurisdiction over, uh, over the city. And um, I would appreciate, I would appreciate if the board, especially Mr. Ennis, would get back to me. I'm sure if you check with the secretary, she would have my phone number. Uh, any questions uh, that you may have, I'll be glad to answer. Again, it's very important that the board look into it. And only because I like to keep it within the county before I start seeking other legal advice outside the county. Uh, do you have any questions? Council, do you uh, want to make a comment? Just a few. Um, I'd ask, uh, is there a board representative? Uh, if uh, Mr. Duran would uh, meet up with Ms. Pierce and uh, give her information regarding the Public Records Act aspects, those requests, we'll certainly check into that and make sure that he gets responses. The grand jury is an arm of the court, not of the county, and of course the district attorney is an independent elected official. It, I have no idea if there is or is not a criminal investigation, but if there is, those documents would be exempt from disclosure under the Public Records Act unless and until uh, charges were filed, and even after that, a great deal of their records would be exempt. So we will try to make sure that Mr. Duran gets uh, a response to whatever public records acts he may have requests he may have made, and we'll deem this one today as, as one also. All right. Thank you, Council. Thank you sure. so much. Thank you for your comments. All right. Are there any other public uh, comments this morning? Sure, sir. Please come forward and state your name for the record, name and address. If you don't recognize me this morning, I lost my glasses and I'm wearing my uh, art kit disguise. <laughs> But I'm here to address the board on the matter of the crossing of Deer Creek at uh, Road 224. And and please state your name and address, sir. Uh, Anonymous, <laughs> Terabella, California. <laughs> um, so I just, uh, I'm, in light of everything that I've learned about the way the county works, I've, uh, I brought a petition asking your support. I already emailed the uh, chairman of the board, whoever that was. <laughs> uh, but if you'd like to look over this petition, or I'm still, I'm still, I'm still collecting signatures. I had one clip clipboard that's lost, but I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't advertise for it because it cost eighteen dollars and eighty-two cents for a lost and found ad in the paper. So I'll find it somewhere along. I got probably three times that number of signatures, but uh, at least you can understand that there are a lot of people who are interested in seeing this thing uh, reach some kind of a culmination prior to the installation of the new bridge, quote, which has been in the works for like five years, four or five years, and we're still trying to get across that river. I saw. I, I said, you want to sign the petition? He said, no, you guys get a boat. <laughs> get a boat and go across the river. That's all I have for today. <laughs> All right, thank you, sir. Well, you'll even let, we'll even let you keep your clipboard, but uh, I have passed your information on to the road You're department. And, uh, the school district, oh, okay. So All right. I'll have to return it one way or another. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, have a great day. Um, all right. Are there any other public comments this morning? From a non a anonymous person, sir, sure, sir. Please do come forward. State your name and address for the record as well. Good morning, my name is Timothy Hamilton from Exeter, and I wanted to address the board this morning on a issue that's been plaguing me for almost 20 years now. I've been diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I've sent letters repeatedly to the board requesting their assistance in this matter. I am a 20-year-plus veteran of law enforcement in Tulare County. 
Due to a conflict between the former captain and my father, my career was cut short after two attempts were made on my life. While working undercover, I was given instructions by a sergeant to change from a regular tactic which put the lives of my fellow deputies as well as my own life in danger. After being forced back to patrol division, I was given a direct order from a captain to remove a crate of decomposed dynamite. It turned into nitroglycerin, which was leaking through my uniform shirt from a residence north of the city of Visalia. When asked by me, why doesn't the bomb disposal unit technician take care of this? The response was he was busy. I've appealed to the sheriff's office, the DA's office, and county council. Individual members of the Board of Supervisors, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, State Sheriff's Association, Post, and the California Attorney General's Office. So far, I've received no answers from these organizations. can only pray that they are conducting their own inquiries. The only satisfaction I have met with is that six deputies, including administrative personnel, have uh, left the Sheriff's Office. I've been diagnosed with PTSD and have finished my memoirs, and I'm eagerly searching for an author to explain the truth in this matter. Also, no case number was ever assigned to my issue, which indicates you have not taken any action as the <coughs> These incidents can only be described as murder attempts, and I am now disabled for life. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I believe there are members of the Sheriff's Department here that you can speak with. Um, thank you. All right, are there any other public comments this morning? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close the public comment period and bring it to the Board of Supervisors. We're going to begin today with Supervisor Michael J. Ennis. <laughs> Well, this, this afternoon we're going to go up and tour a mountain home, which I'm looking forward to. I haven't been up there in a long time and uh, looking forward to seeing some uh, forests that are managed correctly. And we could uh, be able to see the entire county of the park, so that's going to be great. Uh, tomorrow we'll be having another mini gang, uh, mini gang summit meeting at Portobello Police Department. And then uh, Saturday night is the big Sierra View District Hospital gala. Dancing with the Stars. So I'll be out there. I'm not going to be dancing, but uh, I will be there. So that's all I have. All right, Supervisor Ishida. <clears throat> Last week, Supervisor Annis, myself, and CEO uh, Gene Rousseau attended the <coughs> Rural County Representatives of California annual meeting. And this group is a group of supervisors that represent 33 counties in the state of California. And the reason we're members of this organization is that mostly these are mountain counties, very rural, and we have a lot in common with, with that group. And uh, we find that they're very active uh, in protecting our rights in Sacramento. So we had a very successful conference. It was very enjoyable, uh, it was very informative, and look forward to the next one. That's all I have. All right, Supervisor Wordley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yesterday, we had a meeting at the Alta Irrigation District with the state uh, folks and local people regarding the regional water project that Alta is moving forward with. Uh, it's, it's quite a complicated thing because it's tied into the uh, Yedem Seville water project. Uh, we discussed the Munson project, which is something we have on our agenda this morning. And um, I, I, it was a good meeting because there were a lot of people at the table and issues that were raised and uh, being addressed to find resolution. So um, these, these projects are moving forward. It's uh, very exciting. The regional project is uh, kind of one of a kind. The proposal has been one that was prom promoted by the Alta Irrigation District. Um, because of other projects, they've been able to actually secure water rights adequately so that they can put a regional water system in that will treat surface waters uh, for potable water supply purposes that uh, hopefully will reach out Cutler-Rossi all the way out to Seville-Yedem, 
uh, Sultana, uh, Munson, um, so a, a large swath of the northern part of the county where we have a lot of disadvantaged communities and drinking water problems. So it was a very good meeting. I, I too am very excited about going to the uh, demonstration forest uh, this afternoon up in uh, uh, our, our county. I believe it's one of those kind of unknowns that many people are not aware of in Tulare County, just as not aware of Balsh uh, Park, our county park, where we will also be going. Uh, we're the only county in the world that has the giant sequoias that, like we have in our in our park, and I and I think of the demonstration forest as being a vaccinated forest. We need to vaccinate our forest up and down this year in Nevada, so we can avoid the catastrophic fires that have occurred, such as the Rim Fire up near Yosemite. And so I'm looking forward to seeing and and uh, hopefully hopefully we'll have a good number of people from the press there to uh, promote what's happening there, which is, as Mr. Innes indicated, is proper forest management. And when you have proper forest management, you have more water, you have more wildlife, you have more recreation, you have timber, you have employment, and uh, you can almost get utopian about it. But there's a lot that can be done in our forests to uh, restore them to what they need to be and, and avoid the kind of catastrophic fires, as I said. The last I heard, the Rim Fire was up over $150 million of suppression costs. And it's anticipated there'll be another $200 million of expenses in dealing with the aftermath of that fire in terms of erosion control and different things that will be needed. So we're talking about a huge amount of money. And so we've taken an asset, a national forest or, or, or parkland, and turned it into a liability. And so we need to turn that ship around. Uh, Saturday we had a, a very successful raising day in Dinuba, well, well attended and, uh, as far as I know, very quiet and a family-friendly event, and I'm not aware of any problems, and so I think that's about all I have to say today. Uh, the one thing is I did want to let the board know that I am scheduled, as of now, next week to be in Washington, D.C. with the uh, San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control Board folks, but <laughs> in light of the government shutdown, I'm not sure uh, if that trip will still be going forward or, or at what point they'll decide to pull the plug, but anyway, as of now, I will be gone uh, next for next week. Supervisor, and it's like forgot, another forgot, bite of this apple. I forgot to, to comment on one thing that uh, it's been kind of a, a thing between Steve and I for the last few years. <laughs> yeah. oh. Porterville High School. Porterville High School, the uh, big orange and green, uh, beat Dinuba Friday night by two touchdowns. And uh, my nephew, Austin Hefner, was voted the most valuable player of the game. He had a great Austin. game. It was, it was a very exciting game, a very, very good game. All right, thanks for uh, the weekly high school sport update. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, um, now I'm going to move on. Got a few uh, things I want to go over that are happening in District 2. Uh, first of all, today they're having a resource fair uh, called the Roadmap to Resources at the Tulare Senior Center. Uh, that takes place from 6 to 8 p.m. this evening. Um, that is located at 201 North F Street, and it's a resource fair for seniors to learn uh, about caregiver assistance, Alzheimer's support, Medicare 101, housing assistance, etc. I um, think it's a great event and I encourage all the seniors uh, to attend. Maybe some of my colleagues might be interested as well. Um, also uh, covering this week, uh, Big Creek, uh, the Edison Project uh, up in Fresno County, um, is having their centennial event uh, this Thursday. Um, at 10.30 they will have a ceremony. Um, and I've been asked to attend and present a proclamation on behalf of the board, and I'll be glad to do so. Um, Saturday, uh, Grandma's House, uh, a local organization in Tulare that uh, does a lot for youth, is having their fund uh, an annual fundraiser event. Um, that is at 6 p.m. at the Heritage Complex in Tulare. hope that uh, it's a very well-attended event, and they raise lots of funds because they do a lot of really great work. Um, also on Monday... Um, there's going to be an American, I think it's a American Institute of Planning. Uh, not sure about the acronym, but um, it's a, a group of planners, an association of planners that are having their uh, association conference actually here in Tulare County. Um, Going to bring a lot of uh, uh, folks into the area and a lot of revenue uh, to our local uh, economy. Um, hope it's a very successful event for all those planners. Um, and lastly, uh, the South County Justice Center will be having a dedication on Monday in Porterville at 11 a.m. Um, that should be another uh, great event, and it'll be nice to see that complex open and hopefully uh, fully funded for full operation. 
Um, that concludes my Board of Supervisors comments and uh, I will go ahead and move on now to the consent calendar. Are there any items that any m member of the board or member of the public would like to have pulled from the consent calendar for separate consideration? Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Supervisor Worthley, a second by Supervisor Michael T. Ennis. Please vote. Motion passes four to zero uh, with Supervisor Cox not voting because he is not in attendance at today's meeting. The consent calendar passes unanimously. Uh, we are now going to move on to uh, item number 15 uh, on our agenda. It's a request from the Resource Management Agency uh, to approve an amendment with Tulare County Association of Governments to extend the term of agreements to provide transit services to the College of Sequoias. Mr. Bullis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, <coughs> Matthew Bullis, RMA Engineering. <coughs> I have before you today is a Fifth Amendment to Agreement, number 24817, with uh, Tulare County Association of Government for the College of Sequoia Student Transportation Services. Uh, this is a program developed by TCAG as an outgrowth of the unmet transit needs hearing of 2010. At the hearings, there was a need for student uh, passes for COS students. TCAG worked uh, handily with the cities, uh, the county, COS uh, personnel, and affected uh, individuals, and uh, they developed a program where TCAG collects funds for distribution to transit providers to provide uh, this service we're talking about. Uh, the program allows COS students unlimited rides on all fixed transit routes throughout the, uh, the county, cities and county, and offers COS students a low-cost transportation alternative to driving. The program increases ridership, improves air quality, and decreases congestion on campus parking lots. And it's funded by student transportation fees, COS Board of Trustee funds, Measure R funds, federal and state transit funds, and fair revenues. The student transportation fee uh, to the students is a full-time student is $5 per semester, $4 for a part-time student. Uh, the COS Board of Trustees adds a 40%, 40 cents per student fee that goes into that uh, program. Uh, Measure R funds are collected through TCAG, uh, 25000 for uh, two separate uh, semesters for a total of 50000 that goes into the program. And we also have the transit funds and fair revenues if, if we need to augment those programs. Uh, a little hard to read, I apologize. Uh, looking at that, I uh, wish it was a little clearer, but in spring 2000 and, 2001 right here, uh, the oh. number of uh, riders in Tulare County that used the program was 14,128. And as it moves up to the spring 2013, which is over here, ridership is increased to 22,823. Uh, over the six semesters that's been in, in play, 93,000 students have used the program and we have collected 61,727 for our portion of the program. Looking at the, of course, we're not the only ones. Uh, uh, the other cities pr uh, also provide these services. Total ridership, which is, well, hard to get through. There it is. Total ridership on that corner is 776,000 students have used this program. And next to it, $331,000 were collected for this program. So you can see we are a player, a part of this program that we're offering, but the other uh, cities uh, in the area also contribute to the program and also uh, provide the same service. Uh, this agreement timeline, uh, original agreement was a before this board and approved December 14, 2010, and it covered strictly the spring uh, 2001 semester. We've had four additional amendments over the years. Uh, th those covered fall 2011 through summer 2013 semester. This amendment will cover the fall 2013 current semester, spring and summer 2014. Uh, and it will continue the program service as we've had for the last three or four years. And the payment for, uh, formula is uh, in your agreement, and it establishes and it continues that same formula. So I'm here to answer any questions. And I also have Daniel Fox, our county transit manager that runs the program, in the audience to answer anything technical in nature. Uh, questions from board members. Supervisor Worthley. Uh, Matt, is there a reason why we don't do it for longer periods of time, why we have to come back and do this so, every so often? So we... 
this is the programs that's coming through through TCAG. There has been some changes semester to semester, so it has basically been short-term contracts that keep coming back for amendment. This will be the last amendment TCAG is ind indicating. They'll come up with a new agreement. But there has been some changes to the formulas over the years. Oh, good, Hi. Christine. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> um, can I answer that? My name is Christine Chavez. I'm with, the, with TCAG. Um, we haven't entered into a long-term agreement because we've been trying to establish what the baseline ridership has been. Um, looking at the trend, so far you've seen um, seven, over 700,000 riders. Um, we do anticipate after, um, I will say a few words after Matt's done, um, entering into a longer term agreement, we've been trying to establish a base funding source. Um, we've applied for grants through the Air District, through TCAG, and um, so on. So um, that's the reason that we haven't entered into a long term agreement. May I suggest a, uh, a <coughs> primary funder to be the city of Visalia? That's just my. <laughs> Thought. Uh, any other questions or comments from uh, my colleagues? Uh, I'll, I will open it up to uh, questions or comments from members of the public. And since you're up here, Christine, you can go ahead with uh, your comments, please. Okay. I'm here on behalf of the um, director of TCAG, Ted Smalley. He's out of town. And he wanted to express his thankfulness to the Board of Supervisors for being so supportive of the program. Um, in regards to additional funding for the program, um, TCAG staff has been working directly with the City of Visalia and COS to determine a funding program or a funding solution. And we expect to have an outline of our funding plan at the November TCAG board meeting. Um, and you would be pleased to know that as of this morning, we talked to COS and they will be contributing an additional. 30 cents this school year, and then in 2014-15, they'll be contributing an additional 40, 30, 30 cents so that it'll raise their contribution to a dollar per student. <clears throat> and in the spring, it's anticipated for the students to vote on a fee increase. So it would increase full-time students from $5 to $10 and part-time students from $4 to $7 a semester. Um, so that would also increase the base fares and um, we have a couple other grant sources that are fu that are pending out there, and TCAG is going to continue doing research to um, determine what the direct impacts are to transit expansion, um, it, which include anything from additional headways uh, to additional services between the two campuses. Um, and TCAG will be providing that those updates to the TCAG board as they become available. So we encourage the board of supervisors to take action and approve the item. Right, Thank you great. for your support. Any other questions or comments from members of the public this morning? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for comment. Supervisor yeah, Michael Ennis. a great Ennis. program because many of these uh, young people in these outlying areas have no ways of transportation. Very, very to hold and keep these uh, students getting their education and, and moving forward with their lives. So great program, and I would... Uh, no further comment, I'm going to make, I'll make a comment, but I'll definitely look to you first for that motion, Mr. Ennis. Thank you for your eagerness. Um, I, I just want to say this is a great program, and really this is what the unmet needs hearings are about uh, that TCAG holds, uh, where uh, it, all the public is invited to come and talk about needs that aren't met uh, related to transit. Um, and this program came directly out of uh, one of those hearings, as you showed in your presentation. Um, and now we've had over 700,000 riders. I think it's pretty incredible uh, that we've been able to meet that need. Um, and, and, you know, I know Christine mentioned that they're, uh, are, they're looking at uh, fee increases at COS. $10 a semester, I mean, most students, uh, it would probably cost them $10 just for one car trip uh, from their home to the campus and back. Um, so it's really very reasonable. Um, and, and if you look at the number of students, I believe the last time it was surveyed, uh, how many students would not be attending college if it wasn't for this program, I believe it was 430 or, or around that number of students that would not have attended college if they did not have transportation available to them. Um, so I think this is a fantastic thing that uh, transit can provide uh, members of the public so that they can you know, pick themselves up and, and move forward in any career direction or education direction that they would like. So I'm fully supportive of this program and look forward to a longer term agreement uh, and a more permanent uh, status of this program. So, Mr. Ennis, I will now look to you for that motion. Move for approval. Second. All right, we have a motion by Supervisor Ennis, a second by Supervisor Ishida. Please vote. A vote passes four to zero with Supervisor Cox not in attendance. Thank you uh, very much. Today's meeting. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move on, uh, and item number 16 is a tour of the Mountain Homes State Demonstration Forest. 
Uh, we will be uh, adjourning to that trip, uh, but we do have uh, closed session needs, I believe, Council? We do, Mr. Chairman. You have items A through D on your board's closed session agenda. Item B will be continued one week. Uh, I think there will be an announcement. We expect there will be an announcement. All right, that's great. Thank you for attending today's board meeting, and everyone have a great week. Meeting is adjourned. Uh, this is Gene Rousseau, County Administrative Officer, reporting out of closed session on item C to consider the public employee appointment uh, employment for the position of Human Resources Director. On a motion by Supervisor Ishida, seconded by Supervisor Ennis, the board voted unanimously with Supervisor Cox absent to appoint Rhonda Schustrom as the Human Resources Director for the HR&D.